Hi, welcome to our Bible study session. We're on session 10 of our Renewing the Mind series and we're digging down into the mind of Christ. We're talking today about the spirit of knowledge. I'm going to read our foundation verse for this section, which is Isaiah 11 verses 1 to 2. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So, knowledge, the spirit of knowledge. The Hebrew word is death, and it comes from the root yada which means to know. So the spirit of knowledge, it, knowledge is used 942 times in the Old Testament. So it's used in a variety of situations and a variety of contexts. And it can mean um, having knowledge of something by learning or by observing. And it can also mean knowledge as in the sense of really knowing something, having, having experiential uh, knowledge of somebody by that being with them um, and having that close relationship so it's it's really sort of um, got that two uh, types of aspect to it now in our foundation scripture uh, Isaiah 11 2 many biblical dictionaries agree that this knowledge here means experiential knowledge of God so we're going to search the scriptures today and explain this and so it is going to be a bit of a language session so I hope I don't um, put anybody off by that but I've done the hard work so you don't have to do it. So knowing then, knowledge, you know lots of people can quote the Bible and they know the scriptures and they know what they say yet they have no knowledge. They don't know what it really means and they don't know the one who wrote it. Now, it's pretty useless being able to quote things and not really understanding what they mean. I could quote something from a, you know, from a physics book, but actually I don't really know what, what it means. I, I, physics is an area that I really love, quantum physics is an area that I really love, but actually a lot of it I don't understand it and I could perhaps quote it, but I don't really know what it means. So, unless we understand and know unless we can really know, it's not much use to us. So, talking of language, I said this is going to be a bit of a language um, session, I want to get down into the Greek a little bit. The Greek word oida means to know, to have seen, to perceive, and it's part of the verb ido. So oida, you need to remember this word, it's going to come up a lot. Oida is the perfect tense of the verb ido and it means it's a completed action the perfect tense is a completed or an ongoing action so I want you to think about I ate an apple I was eating an apple they're both in the past tense one's a perfect uh, tense though one's a perfect completed action I ate an apple I was eating an apple could be well, I dropped it on the floor. I got disturbed and I dropped it on the floor. I was eating it, but I didn't complete it. There's no completed action there. So we've got this perfect tense where the action is completed. In the present tense, it's ongoing. It's I am eating. I am eating all day long today versus I eat, which is not an ongoing action. It's something you're doing right now, but it denotes that it's not ongoing. So all you need to know is that oida is a perfect tense verb. It means a completed or ongoing action. So it means to know in a complete or an ongoing way. So I know something in a complete way or I know some, something in an ongoing way. I have an ongoing relationship with it. I'm knowing and knowing and knowing it ongoing. So there's an, a relationship to a, um, established in which knowledge is derived. You know, all the knowledge in the world, all the smarts in the world, doesn't mean anything to God. You know, he created it all. He created those laws of physics, quantum physics, mathematics, music. You know, we put all the world into motion. You know, lo knowing lots of stuff in books, having lots of knowledge does not impress God. Many intelligent people have perished in spite of their great knowledge because they haven't had knowledge of God. 
And the verse that we're looking at in Isaiah is talking about the knowledge of God and his word in an intimate way, in a way that we experience him and know him in an ongoing way. Because we'll never fully know God. We can never perfectly know him. So the other kind of knowledge in the Greek language that we come across, if we study the Greek, is ginosko, which means to become aware of. Jesus uses it in Matthew 7 verse 23 when he says, I never knew you, depart from me. So if we were to say, I never ginosko you, I never knew you, it would we would better translate it, I never got to know you. I never had that starting of knowledge with you, if you like never even started out on the journey of knowing you or getting to know you, let alone reached Oida, a personal intimate knowledge. So let's just make sure we understand these two words. Simple definition I've pulled from Strong's to differentiate the two words, which both mean to know. Ginosko means a progress in knowledge or an inception of knowledge, and Oida means fullness of knowledge. So it's got, Oida has this more personal, fuller um, meaning to it. I just want to look at a few verses in the Bible where the two verbs are used in the same verse side by side. So the first one is John 8, 55. Jesus said, yet you have not known him, but I know him, talking of God. So... He says, you have not known him, you have not ginosko him. You have not had this inception of knowledge of him, but I oida him. I know him. I have full knowledge of God. He goes on to say, if I say I do not know him, if I say I do not oida him, I have a full knowledge of him, I should be a liar like you. But I do know him, I do oida him and keep his word. So just that one verse we can see these two types of knowledge displayed. As a, there's a number of them, I'm only going to go through a couple. So John 13 verse 7 is another one. Jesus answered and said to him, what am I doing? What I am doing you do not understand, but you will know after this. So he said to them, uh, what I am doing, you do not understand now. You do not oida. You do not know in full now. You do not understand. You do not oida. But you will ginosko after this. You will start on this journey of knowledge after this. You will come to get to know. You'll have an inception of knowledge after this, Jesus said. And finally, Mark 4.13, Jesus said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So he said, do you not oida this parable? Do you not have any experiential knowledge of this? Do you not have this knowledge? Do you not have a fullness of knowledge of this parable? How then will you ginosko all the parables? How will you come to know, start on the process of knowledge of all the parables? So, from a New Testament point of view, there are two ways to know God. So we start with this ginosko, this inception of knowledge, this beginning journey. I just want to point out that neither of these are bad. I'm not saying that if you have ginosko knowledge, it's bad. It's certainly not. We must start somewhere. <coughs> Excuse me. And we progress or grow into an intimate or fuller knowledge, oida. And as I said, there's lots more um, examples in the Gospels. Um, go and look them up for yourself if you feel you want to. Um, where we have this um, side by side using of these two different ver verbs to know in different situations. You know, and a lot of us start out really good. We start out on Ginosco knowledge and we start with that um, progressing or inception of knowledge. And, you know, we start there with salvation, but we don't progress from that initial inception of knowledge into this fullness of knowledge and this ongoing knowledge of oida in our lives, in our spiritual lives. And that's, and that's not what God wants. 
So let's just switch back to the Hebrew for a, for a, for a short time. Yada in the Hebrew. It's often used in a covenant sense. Yada. Genesis 18, 19. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. For I have yada him. I have known him. You know, this covenant relationship that God started with, with Abraham, I have known him. Why would the word to, to know be used in a covenantal situation between two people? You know, in the, in the ancient Near East, a covenant between two people or between a king and these people, it was considered to be a relationship that couldn't be broken. You know, there would be severe consequences as a result of a broken relationship, a broken covenant or relationship. Um, covenants were, were, they were respected, they were adhered to. It's used in marriage covenants. God, um, Genesis 4 verse 1, Adam knew his wife and she conceived. Adam yada his wife and she conceived. There's another covenant relationship, a covenant that God designed for marriage, an intimate co co uh, covenant between two people. Obviously, this um, has been misused in the world. You know, we enter into this intimacy with people who aren't our spouse and, you know, we go from relationship to relationship, never experiencing the beauty that God designed for it to be between man and wife. We become one with our spouse. You know, that's God's design. So we enter into a covenant with somebody, whether that be a general covenant, a marriage covenant, and we align ourselves with that person. And we become of one accord with them in that matter. You know, and there's a deep knowledge and there's a relationship there. So just like the marriage covenant with its perfect design, that's been put aside for casual purposes, it's been distorted. You know, and we can do the same with our relationship with God. You know, we, we can fail to be transformed um, by the renewing of our minds and we can continue to be conformed to the world. And we treat our saviour with the same imperfect, unholy knowledge that the world indulges in. If we keep yielding to ourselves and being consumed with our own wills and our own desire and our own way, then this is what will happen. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, lack of death, the root word of yad, the root word yada, um, produces the word death, knowledge, intimate knowledge, my people are destroyed for lack of intimate knowledge, that's quite a, dis a statement from the Lord, destroyed, it means to be caused to cease, to cut off. You know, it mirrors Jesus' warning to abide in the vine. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bear fruits, bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Verse 6 of John 15 says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. They are Jesus' words, you know. He warns us to abide, that means to live. Live, not just on a Sunday morning, not just once or twice a week, but live. Every time you breathe in and out, you're living. Every breath we take, every moment by moment uh, decision should be in line with God. We should be acknowledging him in all our ways. We are part of the vine, yet many of us don't abide stay, live in him. I don't get to a place where they live each day in a growing knowledge and intimacy of the Lord. They live their own way, never acknowledging God and rarely reading his word. This ought not be so. God tells us through his word he's not looking for a long distance relationship. He's not happy being a part-time God in our lives. Yeah, he wants to abide with us every day. That's why he sent his spirit to live within us every hour of every day, every minute of every hour. 
we should be abiding, living, communicating, enjoying, having that personal, intimate knowledge and relationship with him. That's true relationship. We're to live by faith. Faith is continuing when you can't see the outcome. Believing in God's word when you can't see the fruit of it yet. You know, and lots of people fall when they have to continue to live by faith for a longer time than they're happier with. You know, if they don't see the results immediately, they start to falter. When we continue in faith, we grow in our intimacy with God and we grow in our knowledge of God and his word. You know, and God does answer prayer. His promises are yes and amen. If it's in his word, if it's promised in his word, it's a yes and amen and it will come to pass. It so happens that many of us actually come to a more intimate relationship when we go through tough times and we have nowhere to turn. So we have to have faith and rely on God because there's nowhere else to go to. We cling to him then and then we start to actually start living the life we should. You know, when things are going good, we sort of, we don't need God. We drift away a bit. So that ought not be so. Trials and temptations, though, can separate the wheat from the chaff. Some people fall away when they come into trials and temptations and they won't hold on to God and they just want it sorted now and they won't stand in faith and cling to God. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 8 says, We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. You know, we all go through trials, we all go through tough times. Paul says we're hard pressed on every side, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. You know, the important point that gets us through is our knowledge of God, our intimate knowledge of him. Knowledge of how good and gracious and merciful and patient and long-suffering and loving he is. You know, and love is a key element because if we have no personal uh, understanding and knowledge of God's love, when we've only heard about it from other people and we don't really know about it for ourselves, we will start to falter. We can't rely on somebody else's experience of God or God's love to get us through. We have to experience it for ourselves. When we begin to experience and understand intimately, and we know God's love for us, then we know that through any trial we can say, just like Paul did, that we're secure. You know, we can say we're loved by God. What can man do to us? We'll start to understand we're in a covenant relationship with him through Jesus. So how can anyone know God? How can we know his love for ourselves? You know, this is a special revelation by the Holy Spirit to us when we press in. We have to choose to do this in order for it to manifest. We have to make a conscious choice and actually act. So this is one of the reasons why these last two elements of the Holy Spirit's functions are slightly different to the first. Yes, we need to be submitted and we need to be born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, submitted to him. But you know, these two, these last two are slightly different. So the first five are available to us to the Holy, through the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, within us. We ask for wisdom, we ask for guidance, we ask for counsel, you know, and they're all available to us there when we need them. You know, the Holy Spirit will flow through us and he will give us that, um, that knowledge, that, sorry, that understanding or the wisdom, sorry. But knowledge is slightly different because it's impossible to achieve knowledge of God without the Holy Spirit, but it also requires something more from us. So it requires this pressing in, it requires dedication. You need, we need to be all in for Jesus, basically. We have to delve in. We're not just wading in up ankle deep or knee deep. We're getting straight in, diving in completely submerging ourselves in God and his word you know and we need that in order and the yielding and submitting in in order to have this personal knowledge 
you know, lots of people can operate in the gifts of the Spirit and yet have no real intimate knowledge of the of God or the fear of the Lord. If you study the church at Corinth, you'll see that they were, you know, they were abusing some of the gifts of the Spirit. You know, Paul had to talk to them about it. So, we've got something more of us required for this, but it's worth it. So the word oida, back to the Greek again, means to see. To see for ourselves, to have that personal, ongoing, complete or ongoing knowledge. So... Job said in uh, 42 verse 5, My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Now, we don't get the sense in the book that Job saw God with his physical eyes, but when he said that, he says, I'd heard of you, but now I see you. I have been spiritually uh, healed if you like, and now the eyes of my heart can see you. I have this deeper knowledge of who you are. And you know, we were created to know God. God created us to be in an intimate relationship with him, to know him. You know, he created man and woman to be in relationship with each other through covenantal marriage. He created a nation to be a people in intimate knowledge with him through covenant. He created the church to be a body to his son, to be in a covenant relationship with him through faith. We're created to know God intimately. Philippians 1.21 says, for me to live is Christ. Paul knew what life was all about. He said, the reason for living is Christ. It's to know God. It's to know Jesus. Philippians 3 verse 8 says, Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. How many of us count everything else in life absolute rubbish compared to the knowledge of Christ? In compared to knowing Christ, Paul said everything is like dung. He used quite a strong word. He says it's like dung. It's like something I'd put in the bin. The greatest riches that I could possibly have, they're nothing. They're just like something that belongs on the rubbish pile compared to knowing Christ. If everything were stripped away like Job, would we still say that? Would we still say, do you know what? It doesn't matter. I know Christ. It doesn't matter if I don't have anything. Knowledge of God is our most precious treasure. Proverbs 24, verses 3 to 4. Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Those ple pleasant and precious riches is knowing Jesus. By the knowledge of knowing him, we fill ourselves with precious and pleasant riches. We need the spirit of wisdom and understanding to build the house, but we need to fill it with precious and pleasant riches, knowing Christ, intimate knowledge of him. And we fill it, our hidden chambers, our hidden rooms, our head air, with knowledge of Christ. Hallelujah. I want to leave you with these questions. Why is this element of the sevenfold Holy Spirit different to the first five? If you haven't picked up on it, I would encourage you to study it. What does intimate knowledge of God really mean to you? How many people have progressed beyond the inception and beginning of knowledge? Have you progressed beyond the inception and beginning of knowledge? Why is knowing about God not enough? Why do we need experiential, personal knowledge of God? Until next time, God bless.